Yeah. That would be great. Thanks. Otherwise, you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Heels for her. Okay, everyone. Uh, Kristen will continue her lectures from earlier today. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming back for the next installment. So. Um, in the first lecture, I introduced... Oh, thank you. That's much better. Um, in the first lecture, I introduced uh, supersingular isogeny graphs and explained how they could be used to um, construct a cryptographic hash function. And so the goal in this lecture is to um, explain a little bit the background and the context of supersingular isogeny graphs as what we call expander graphs. And also to explain another application, which is uh, the key exchange application, which is actually the one that's um, uh, in the standardization process for the NIST uh, PQC competition. So um, can everybody hear me at the back? Is it good? Okay, excellent. Thanks. Okay, so let's start by uh, what do we mean by expander graphs. The title of our original 2005 paper introducing supersingular isogeny graphs into cryptography was called um, uh, Cryptographic Hash Functions from Expander Graphs. So it was not just SIG, supersingular isogeny graphs, but in general expander graphs that we were proposing. Um, in particular, the other um, main graph that we focused on was the um, LPS, Lubatsky Philip Sarnak graphs. Uh, so what is an expander graph? So as I said uh, in the first lecture, the notation that I'm using is um, G equals V comma E, where V is the set of vertices and E is the set of edges for the graph. And um, we are concentrating on the case of K regular graphs, where each vertex has K edges coming out of it. So an expander graph that has N vertices, which has expansion constant C, um, is a graph such that if you take any subset U of the vertices, such that um, the, the size of the subset is less than, less than or equal to half of the vertices, then if you take the boundary of U, which means all vertices that are connected to U but which are not in U, then the boundary boundary of U has to be at least size C times the size of U. So that expansion constant, um, just kind of um, from a, an intuitive point of view, just gives you how much the, um, the any set is growing when you add the boundary to it. So and then you, you keep adding, adding the boundary to it. And um, it grows and grows. So that's the uh, that's what we mean by an expander graph uh, with expansion constant C. And so the you can think of um, you can uh, get some properties of the graph from actually doing some linear algebra on the adjacency matrix of the graph, and that is actually connected to the expansion constant. So I'm not you know going into a whole course on graph theory here, but just trying to tell you some of the relevant um, facts. So the adjacency matrix of a graph, let's call it um, A with entries A, I, J, uh, is given by, so the ijth entry of the matrix is given by the number of edges from the ith vertex to the jth vertex. So if there's n vertices in the graph, this is an n by n matrix. And um, so I guess I use the notation A of L just um, if we're talking about the L isogeny graph. That is, the edges are L isogenies, isogenies of degree L, where in our context L is always co prime to the characteristic, so these are all, all separable isogenies. So um, the adjacency matrix of an undirected graph is symmetric because there's no difference between edges from I to J and edges from J to I. So since the matrix is actually sy symmetric, all of its eigenvalues are real. And so for a connected K regular graph, we have the, uh, several facts which are very useful which is that the largest eigenvalue is actually uh, k, where k is the, the degree of the regular graph, and all of the other eigenvalues are strictly smaller. So um, if you look at the notation I'm using here, um, uh, 
where, where k is the largest eigenvalue, let's see, I don't, I don't have a pointer, but I think the, the cursor goes there. So this uh, difference between k and the next largest eigenvalue is, uh, that difference is usually called the spectral gap. And so when, um, you look at this uh, formula, this next formula, which gives you a lower bound on this expansion constant. So C is greater than or equal to um, this uh, expression here, two times this spectral gap divided by um, this quantity here. Um, what you can see is, is that this spectral gap is related to the ex how good of an expander this graph is. So um, you'll have a whole it's a whole area of study um, just uh, thinking about this spectral gap and in particular you want this spectral gap to be kind of as large as possible and so we have um, what we call Ramanujan graphs which refer to being optimal in a particular sense so it's a little bit nuanced it's not quite as clear cut as that um, we don't necessarily have um, a lower bound on this um, uh, this spectral gap, but what we have is asymptotically the alain bopana theorem, which says that if XM is an infinite family of connected K regular graphs with the number of vertices tending to infinity, then the lim-inf of this mu1 will be bounded below by 2 square root of K minus 1. So what that means is not that it's always greater than 2 square root of k minus 1 because that would give you a, an absolute lower bound than um, or a, on, on mu 1 which gives you an, an upper bound on the spectral gap but at least in the limit it says that these um, that this uh, quantity mu 1 the second largest eigenvalue is going to be um, bounded below by 2 square root of k minus 1 so so in our case, k is equal to L plus 1, where we're uh, looking at the graph with, with L isogenies. And so um, what you're looking at is uh, a lower bound on the um, mu1, which is um, which is 2 times square root of L. So now, um, what I'd like to do is, I definitely am not going to give you the proof that these graphs are Ramanujan, um, which involves a lot of very sophisticated number theory and theorems, but just to give you the idea of why th these we know that these graphs are Ramanujan. So actually, this Ramanujan property, um, uh, what you can, since k minus 1 is equal to L in this case, um, what we're really just asking is that um, in order to be Ramanujan, that mu1 should be less than or equal to 2 times square root L. So um, the reason, the way this comes about is that um, if you look at uh, the vector space S2 of P, which, are, which is the vector space of weight two cusp forms of level P, it turns out that the action of the HECA operator, uh, TL, is actually given by the Brandt matrix, um, I'll just call it B, B of L, but which is actually equal to the adjacency matrix of this graph. So what ends up happening, and behind the scenes what's happening and we'll talk more about this tomorrow in my next lecture, is that there's an alternate description of this graph. The supersingular isogeny graph that we've proposed for use in cryptography has nodes which are elliptic, you know, representative uh, elliptic curves which are representatives of their isomorphism class and isogenies which are the edges between them. But we could de describe that graph in a different way which is in terms of the endomorphism rings of these supersingular elliptic curves. As I mentioned the elliptic curve, the supersingular elliptic curves have endomorphism ring, which are 
maximal orders in a um, rank four uh, maximal orders in a definite quaternion algebra. And so if we flip over and we think of our graph instead of being elliptic curves with isogenies, we actually think of it as being maximal orders in quaternion algebra with um, connecting ideals between them that are of a certain norm, in this case norm L. Then we have a different description of our graph and we actually have a different way to, to attack the underlying cryptographic problems. And um, so unfortunately, or fortunately, one or the other, um, it's very hard to actually make this correspondence. So these, we know that these two graphs are the same, but we don't know how to match them up. Because over in, on this side, we can say a lot about its properties and we can also actually um, get an attack on, on this side, which I, I will explain tomorrow. But um, so we are actually using the description of the graph over on this side to claim that it's Ramanujan and um, these graphs when we introduced them into cryptography we called them Pizer graphs because Pi Pizer was uh, the one that described them in I, I'm sorry I can't remember it was the late 80s or early 90s and proved the Ramanujan property when P is congruent to 1 mod 12 um, but another uh, name for the graph are, they are often called Mestra graphs because Mestra recognized um, that these graphs, well, he may or may not have recognized that they were Ramanujan, but anyway, he was using them in the theory of modular forms. He introduced what was called the method of graphs um, for computing um, bases for spaces of modular forms. So you'll have some people calling them Mestra graphs, some people calling them Pizer graphs, and then in cryptography we're calling them super singular isogeny graphs. So the Ramanujan property comes when you recognize this um, um, this um, fact that the Brandt matrix is actually the same as the adjacency matrix for these graphs. And we have um, uh, Deline's proof of, of the Vey conjecture that give you um, that the eigenvalues of this matrix actually satisfy the Ramanujan uh, condition. So that's, you can see there's a lot of um, deep theorems from number theory going into that to establish that these graphs are Ramanujan. So that being said, honestly, we don't really use the Ramanujan property in cryptography. The fact that these are optimal expander graphs um, means that the output of this hash function is as basically as close as we can get to being uh, uniformly distributed. So that's the main uh, kind of outcome that I, I want to talk a, about a little bit um, next. Um, just a, a very side note is, is that uh, when we first proposed um, these graphs for use in cryptography in 2005, we were not actually working on the elliptic curve uh, graphs um, that we uh, use now today. Uh, with Yal Gorin and Dennis Charles, we were actually working on a, a, a higher dimensional analog of the graphs, which you can um, get from looking at um, what we call super special abelian varieties and super special orders in abelian varieties. So our construction, um, which is in a different paper um, from 2007, is actually constructing families of Ramanujan graphs from higher dimensional abelian varieties. But there were so many problems with making this explicit if you wanted to use this for a hash function construction that we actually just kind of simplified things and went back down to dimension one and looked at elliptic curves um, for the cryptographic applications. Um, but there's now starting to be more and more interest in the isogeny community in developing higher genus and higher dimensional analogs of um, these uh, cryptographic constructions, so in particular genus two. And, you know, the problems that we had with our graphs in higher dimension, even g d dimension two, were that we would be looking at... Um, abelian surfaces where we didn't really have good um, invariants that we could use to label them so we didn't have there are EGUSA invariants but EGUSA invariants are pretty hard to compute uh, number two uh, we didn't actually have in 2005 a really good way to compute isogenies between abelian varieties um, since then that problem has also been kind of solved so there's the AV isogenies package from uh, Damien Robert and um, uh, Lercier and their collaborators 
generators, so that problem has kind of been solved. But um, just in terms of efficiency for cryptographic purposes, the, our very abstract dimension two analog of these graphs is still very unwieldy to work with. And so what we've seen is um, some newer proposals, um, at least one that I know of, for example, from Fl um, Fleury and Smith, which proposes to use um, essentially the Rosenhine model for genus two curves as the nodes in the graph and um, isogenies, but then you don't have as many of the nice properties automatically, at least, as we have for, for our graphs, which is being connected expander graphs that are optimal in the sense of being Ramanujan. Okay, so that part about the higher dimensional analogs was just a little bit of an aside here. So now back to using these objects for um, cryptographic purposes. Um, so to avoid some kind of bias in the output of these hash functions, it would be nice if the, uh, the um, output was kind of uniformly distributed. And the expansion constant for expander graphs gives you a very explicit way to relate how well you approximate the uniform distribution to the expansion constant of the graph. So the, the better your expansion constant, the more closely you, you, um, you can approximate the uniform distribution in a short number of steps as you take a walk through the graph. So um, w one, another thing I should have probably said uh, earlier today is, is that this idea of using expander graphs um, for um, doing all kinds of things and proving theorems in complexity theory and um, number theory is, is not at all new. So computer scientists have been using um, walks in expander graphs as a way to approximate you know, uniform or, or uniformly random outputs for a long time. And so the, the thing that we did that was different when we introduced these graphs into uh, cryptography was, well, first of all, introducing specific graphs, the isogeny graphs. But second of all, we were really trying to get this cryptographic property that it's hard to find collisions or it's hard to find pre-images. And those are both tied to being able to find a walk, a, you know, a path in this graph. So, but if you think about it from like the complexity theory point of view, the computer scientist point of view, they, they have a very different point of view than what a lot of people working in isogeny-based crypto do right now. Which is, just think about it from a common sense um, point of view. Let's say you have a three regular graph like I've told you is our main object of study here, a three regular graph, and once you start your walk, you're not allowed to backtrack. So you cannot go backwards. So every time you get to a node, you only have two choices for your next step. So that means basically if you take n steps, you will visit, and you don't have any collisions, like you never hit a repeat. If, if you take n steps, then and you don't backtrack and you hit no collisions, then you will have visited two to the n vertices. So what that means is, is that when you think about the diameter of these graphs, like the diameter means it's kind of like the, whatever, the maximum over the minimum of, so given any two pairs of points in the graph, what is the minimum distance between them? And then now take the maximum over all pairs. So that's, that's the diameter. Like if you give any two, um, two uh, nodes in the graph, then there will be a path, there exists a path, um, which is no bigger than the diameter. So um, what, w given what I've just said, that if you take a walk of length n, you'll visit two to the n vertices, you can see that roughly speaking, you, will ex you expect the diameter to be roughly the log of the number of vertices. And so having an optimal expander graph, having this Ramanujan property gets you kind of as close uh, as possible to this uh, theoretical understanding. So in general, you'll have the, the diameter will be somewhere between um, log of the size of G and two log the size of G. And I believe that it's still a conjecture that for these graphs that um, I think this is due to Lubatsky, Philip Sarnak, that that expansion constant is between one and, and four thirds. And actually within our uh, Win4 group, we did a lot of uh, computation um, Yana, in particular, did a lot of computation on this, and um, 
it's still uh, it's still hard to see whether <laughs> the expansion constant is uh, is uh, tending towards four thirds or or closer to one. So. Um, Anyway, this is all kind of background about um, the, the properties of this graph. And w the reason that I focus on this for, for a few minutes here and a couple of slides is that thinking of SIG, the super singular isogeny graphs, abstractly in terms of expander graphs and the kind of the, like the more the combinatorial point of view um, gives you different insight than if you just think of it in terms of, of elliptic curves. And that's kind of the point of view that I've always had because we started with the point of view of, ex of proposing expander graphs in general for, for cryptography. So now I'd like to move on to the uh, other applications of super singular isogeny graphs. In particular, um, in 2011, um, Zhao and DeFeo uh, proposed a key exchange um, from super singular isogeny graphs um, and encryption in a paper in 2014 uh, with Zhao, DeFeo, and Plu. And um, in 2016, there have been a number of signature schemes that have uh, also been proposed. I just uh, picked out a couple of them here. Uh, Galbraith, Petit, and Silva um, proposed a signature scheme in 2016, and then um, SQ sign is a signature scheme that was is proposed in 2020. So I will talk about the signature application um, tomorrow, um, but my goal right now is to talk about the key exchange application. So. Um, this is the actual um, scheme that is proposed in the NIST PQC competition, which is now in the fourth round. It's called PSYC, Super Singular Isogeny Key Exchange, uh, based on um, Zhao, DeFeo, and Plu's uh, work and paper. And um, so the only thing is that um, in their original paper, which was quite long, you had a, a lot of different hardness assumptions being uh, introduced actually five different hardness assumptions none of which were known previously and had not they had not been stated previously and they were not related to other known hard problems so that made it a little bit weird and a little bit hard to understand um, the security of this uh, key exchange and so um, what I'll, I'll explain in this lecture today is is that um, in a fairly intuitive way you can see that the security of this key exchange also relies on the same hard problem that the um, hash function relies on, which is the hardness of finding paths in this graph. Okay, so um, first let me just give you a picture. It's like a diamond here. And these arrows are isogenies. And, um, but they are not um, a single uh, step in the graph. Each of these arrows is um, uh, a whole bunch of steps, like N steps in one case and M steps in the other, and then N and M. So within the graph, e each of these uh, si uh, top and bottom of this diamond corresponds to N plus M steps in the L isogeny graph. Um, so here's how they propose to do key exchange. So for those of you, it's like Diffie-Hellman. So for those of you that know um, Diffie-Hellman, so each party, uh, they usually say Alice and Bob, would pick a, a secret integer. And there will be... Um, a, uh, a known, a public, um, publicly known point on the elliptic curve. And in the group of points on the elliptic curve, Alice would compute like A times P and Bob would co compute B times P, not sharing the integers A or B. And then um, they would make that, that they would sh make it public, basically share with each other. Alice shares A times P and Bob shares B times P. And then they each know their own secret. So when they receive this other point from the other person, they can use their secret and multiply times the point they received and in the end both parties can compute A times B times the point P and any eavesdropper just sees A, P and B, P and all they can do is compute A plus B times P. So um, Zhao DeFeo Plut's um, uh, key exchange is very analogous to this but instead Alice, what Alice is going to do is going to pick a secret isogeny so let me see if I can get my 
cursor here, a secret isogeny, which we're calling phi sub a, and Bob is going to pick a secret isogeny, phi sub b, and so what happens is that they each are going to um, compute this, this curve E sub A and or E sub B and make that public or share it with each other. We assume when I say make it public, meaning you can, if they share it with each other, you can assume there might be an eavesdropper. So it might as well just assume that information is public. And then there's going to be some, actually some auxiliary information. So this is something that can potentially make this problem easier than just um, the hardness of finding paths. But using that auxiliary information, both out and Bob can compute these um, other isogenies, phi prime sub A and phi prime sub B, and they can both compute this other elliptic curve, E sub AB, and use the J invariant of this uh, final curve, E sub AB, in order to um, uh, establish their common secret. And so I like to describe it that way so you can see how it's analogous to Diffie-Hellman key exchange, except this time it's with, with isogenies. So let's be a little more specific about how this works. So the key exchange setup is going to be... Um so E is going to be a starting point. It's a super singular elliptic curve over FP squared, but P has to be of a particular form in order for this to work. So we're going to assume that P is actually, you have two small primes, LA and LB, and these are basically the degree of isogenies in the, the two isogeny graphs that Alice and Bob are going to go work in. But just to make things easier, you can just assume LA is 2 and LB is 3. That is the most efficient instantiation of this system. So really what you're saying is that P is equal to some large power of 2 times some large power of 3 plus 1. So, and it needs to be prime, of course, which won't always be the case. But for reasons that I'll explain in a minute, these powers, M and N, also need to be somewhat similar to each other. They're... Um, for security reasons. So in order to exchange the key, given this setup, what they need is they need to work um, on the torsion points on the elliptic curve. So something that I didn't explain earlier about ECC is, is that in general for the implementation of classical elliptic curve cryptography, you want to have a curve and over a, f a finite field FP where the curve has either a prime number of points on it or close to a prime number of points. If the order of your group is smooth, then you have attacks which will run in time proportional to the um, square root of the largest prime factor. So for security reasons, you really want the order of the elliptic curve to be prime. And here we have something similar, which is that um, in the, so over the base field, um, in the classical elliptic curve case, you'll take a generator of that prime sub, either prime order group or prime order subgroup, the largest prime that divides the order of the group. And that'll be your point P. So you could call that, like if the order of that group is, is M, you can call that an M torsion point. Well, if you want to do your operations over the base field, and as I explained earlier today, I mean, the bigger the field, the more costly it is to, to compute in it. If you want to do it over the base field, then you actually need the point to be defined over the base field. And so that's an issue here too, and that is is that the reason we choose P to be of this form is so that we actually have um, that LA and um, LB to these powers divides P minus 1. So that's why P is picked to be of this form. So we're going to take um, points uh, that are um, P, a, P sub A and Q sub A for Alice and P sub B and Q sub B for Bob, which actually generate the relevant torsion um, subgroups for these elliptic curves. Um, so uh, E adjoin like 2 to the M and E adjoin uh, 3 to the M, 3 to the N. Sorry. 
So now Alice and Bob, in order to do um, their key exchange, are going to pick uh, random integers. So um, A pick, uh, Alice picks M sub A, N sub A, and Bob picks M sub B, N sub B, and uses Velu's formulas, or there are more efficient ways to compute um, this, uh, this isogeny, um, which I'm not going to talk about, but I think that um, there's um, some, some exercises kind of going into this, that um, A uses Velu's formulas to compute the isogeny, which is taking E and quotienting by the subgroup MA times PA plus NA times QA. And then Bob will do the same thing. So what you end up with is, is that Alice and Bob have each computed their new elliptic curve. They can use Velu's formulas to compute the new J invariant and the model for these curves, EA and EB. And then um, using the uh, knowledge of um, uh, these points, the images of these points, like the images of Bob's points under Alice's isogeny and the image of Alice's points under Bob's isogeny, that's the auxiliary information which is provided. Now they can each use that to then apply their secret integers to create the, the next um, subgroup that they need to quotient by. So EA will be, or Alice will be quotienting EA by a subgroup, um, basically MA uh, times um, Phoebe of PA plus NA times Phoebe of QA, etc. In order to um, uh, compute the curve EAB, and then Bob will do kind of the analogous thing on his side, and they will both end up um, computing the same curve. So one way that you can see that it's the same curve is by actually just seeing that by quotienting twice, again, these are a billion groups, you're, you're quotienting by two subgroups here, that you have actually um, done the same job on the top and the bottom. You've actually uh, quotiented by the same um, subgroup, and that's why you end up at the same curve. So now let's think about um, the, uh, the security of this um, key exchange. So clearly, if you can find um, the isogeny, for example, phi A, then you can, uh, so if, I'm sorry, if you can find the path between E and E A, then you can um, break the key exchange. So um, one thing to note is, is that um, the walks on each stage of the key exchange here are only roughly half the diameter of the graph. Okay, so let's go back to um, this expression for P. So P is, think of it as 2 to the M times 3 to the N plus 1. And um, so if you, let's say that this were just two, uh, two and three are pretty close to the same size. So just thinking about the size of things, if you just take two to the N plus M plus one, that's roughly P. So if you take the log, like the log base two of, of the size of the graph, which I told you is P over 12, the log here is basically M plus N. And I told you that the diameter of these graphs is roughly the log of the total number of vertices. So what we're saying is, is that in general, the, the length of a path to get from one vertex to, an, to the, uh, another random vertex is going to be M plus N. And if M and N are roughly the same size, then in each stage of this diamond, you're only going about half the diameter of the graph. And so that's why I said I like to think about these things from a kind of combinatorial point of view, and that is that um, just go back to my description where I said, you know, in a three regular graph with no backtracking, you know, if you take a, a, a walk of length n, you only get at, at most to two to the n new vertices. So if you only take a walk of length half log of the vertices, you are not visiting most of the points. You're visiting basically like one over um, square root of p of the points. And so 
if P is like 2 to the 256, or in this application, two, P, P needs to be bigger, um, if it, it's, you know, it's 500 bits or 750 bits, uh, if you take two random um, vertices in the graph, it's very unlikely that there is a path of length half the diameter between them. So, um, what that means th is that if you can, f if you are given these two points, E A, e, I'm sorry, E and E A, and if you can find a path between them, then it's overwhelmingly likely that it was the path that was used to set up the key exchange. So what that shows you is that um, pathfinding is um, most likely, uh, with very very high pro probability, um, enough to to break this uh, crypto system. At worst, you could just run your algorithm again and try to um, get another path uh, if, if that was not the path that was used in the key exchange. Um, so this was formalized as part of a, a paper in um, 2017 from my Win4 group with um, Anna Kostash, uh, Brooke Feigen, um, Micah Messer, and um, Anna Puskas. And uh, it's a little bit more formalized here, basically saying that if you can... Uh, do pathfinding in these graphs, uh, the LA isogeny graph and the LB isogeny graph, then in either one of those graphs, then you will be able to break the key exchange with very high probability. The probability being basically the probability that you failed being basically 1 over square root of P. So like 2 to the minus 256, for example. So um, the nice thing then is that gives us kind of a clean story. Um, it's not maybe quite as clean as that. Certainly pathfinding has to be hard in order for this key exchange to be secure. If you can find an al uh, efficient algorithm for, f for, for pathfinding in the two isogeny graph or the three isogeny graph, then you will be able to break the key exchange. However, um, just like Nadia's comment about the non-equivalence of uh, factoring and, and breaking RSA, um, especially in this case, there's some auxiliary information that's given in this in this protocol, which is the image under these isogenies of the public points of your your person you're trying to do the key exchange with. So um, it is possible that there are easier ways to break this key exchange that do not involve um, finding finding paths in these graphs. Okay, so just to kind of restate um, the uh, what are the hard problems in the super singular isogeny graph that we're relying on. So to avoid collisions, um, we're like the picture I showed this morning very briefly, uh, a collision would be two paths from the same starting point to the same ending point. So that's a cycle. So that's hardness of finding cycles in these graphs. Um, finding, uh, so you could state that as either um, the difficulty of producing a pair of super singular elliptic curves, E1 and E2, and two distinct isogenies of degree L to the N between them, which are, by the way, not equal to just multiplication by L to the N over 2. Um, and Or you could say it in terms of um, finding an endomorphism, which actually corresponds to going um, along one path and going back along the other path. So that would be an endomorphism of the initial curve, E, which has degree e L to the 2N, which is not multiplication by, by the L to the N map. So um, that's, those are are two different ways to say what is the hard problem uh, in terms of elliptic curves that corresponds to collisions and then in the way another way to say what the hard problem is that corresponds to finding paths is given two super singular elliptic curves just to find an isogeny of degree L to the N between them. So uh, just as a little side comment there is um, a question in the context of the hash function whether you fix the length of the path. Like, um, as I mentioned, a hash function can be generically thought of as a function which maps uh, uh, bit strings of length m to bit strings of length n. And so once you've um, done that, that um, pretty much fixes the, the length of the path. And um, 
so that's why I've stated this here as finding an isogeny of degree um, exactly L to the N. Um, but you could think a little bit more generally about um, what if you're allowed to find paths of different lengths, not just length N. So that could potentially be a, a, an easier problem. Okay, so then the last thing that I want to talk about um, today, uh, it's a, a little bit late and we've been talking and listening for a long time today, so I think I will uh, try to end a little bit early. Um, but so the last uh, topic I, I wanted to address is what do generic attacks on this crypto system look like? So when we say generic attacks in cryptography, we, or we often call them square root attacks, um, we're often thinking about um, the like, uh, you know, Pollard Row or Baby Step, Giant Step, or, you know, kind of birthday, basically birthday paradox attacks. And so uh, what we mean by that is that um, if you kind of just assume that everything is random and you apply these um, these algorithms where you do some kind of either, you know, random um, uh, steps or some kind of deterministic rule even that like approximates random behavior, um, that you'll end up with um, these square root attacks which heuristically run in usually the square root of the group size. So because we know of generic attacks for almost everything, including this, which I'm just about to tell you, that's what also makes us to set the, the parameters the way we do. So for the hash function, um, at the time when we proposed it, if we wanted um, a kind of US government minimum security, which is 128 bits, we wanted to set the size of the graph to be basically 256 bits so that the best generic attacks would run in time roughly 2 to the 128, making it roughly, two, you know, that secure, 2 to the 128. Um, so since the number of nodes is, like I said, the Eichler class number, which is P over 12, roughly, um, that means that that's why we set P to be 256 bits for the hash function. Now, what you could see from what I explained about the key exchange is that P needs needs to be at least like twice as big for the key exchange because um, the walks those walks are only half as long half as half as long as the diameter whereas in the hash function the walks are length fully the full diameter of the graph so you can think of a basically a birthday attack strategy on this problem which is that you randomly you have Two, uh, two nodes in the graph. You're trying to find a path between them. So you take a random walk from both sides, from both ends, until it hits each other. So, and then um, given the kind of uh, reasoning of the, of the birthday attack, this will run in time roughly square root of the, um, the graph size. So in other words, kind of starting from both ends and kind of a meet in the middle kind of attack. So um, the generic attacks are, have been you know, known since the beginning. And uh, since we first proposed these, uh, cur these graphs, uh, we considered a lot of different um, kind of strategies for, for attacking them. And the main kind of, I would say, most promising strategy that we have today is that instead of thinking of these graphs as being the nodes are the elliptic curves and the edges are the isogenies, if you can somehow move over to the other um, description of this graph, which is in terms of maximal orders in a quaternion algebra and um, connecting ideals between them, uh, we actually have an algorithm for um, a relatively efficient algorithm for attacking the graph in that setting. And so what that leaves us with is the fact that um, the security of these crypto systems is based on uh, actually being able to do this association of these two graphs, which is called computing the endomorphism ring. So for every node, if you can actually just compute its endomorphism ring as a maximum order in the quaternion algebra, um, then you'll be able to use the attacks over here on this side and kind of get back. 
an attack on the original problem. So luckily, like I said, luckily or unluckily, the problem of computing the endomorphism ring seems to be just as hard as computing the paths in the original graph, so far, anyway. But there's a lot of interesting work in the community going on now on, on that particular problem. So that will be the topic of my uh, lecture for tomorrow. And so for now, I'd just like to um, stop and thank you for listening and see if there's any questions. There was somebody that had a question this morning that didn't get to ask it, but I don't know if they're still here. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any, so let's thank Kristen again.